Let's get started with the, the next presentation. Uh, the next team is the is another one of our uh, uh, multidisciplinary teams. Uh, civil concentration, two mechanical concentrations. Um, probably should have thrown electrical on this as well, but we got to do that. So um, their project they're working on actually started um, as a um, trip to Myanmar to uh, uh, observe some of the uh, work that's being done by the Church of the Nazarene for a new campus there. And uh, we started looking at supporting them with water distribution. So go ahead and explain your problem and take it away. All right, so uh, first of all, just thank you all for being here and supporting us. Uh, my name is Crystal, and um, just, these are my partners, Michael Kulowski and Mahana al -Sharif. And we are the Machino Water Distribution Team. So before I start my presentation, I'm just going to ask that if you do have any questions, just to hold off until the question um, portion at the end, just write them down with the slide number, and you can address them later. So um, our goal is for this project uh, focused on a campus in Machina, Myanmar. Uh, it's being developed into a Church of Nazarene District Center where local pastors and their families can come to receive training. So uh, during their time there, they're actually going to be living on campus. And even though um, construction is still underway for the campus and it's still being developed, they're already living there and their only access to water is a shallow open-faced well and the sanitation of that water is questionable at best. So um, we're jumping in to tackle the task of providing them with clean and sanitary water for drinking and cooking and other such activities. So our goal for this project is to meet these requirements and standards. We have four of them. The first one is water must be safe to drink and they're using the U.S. National Primary Drinking Water Regulation and system must be physically safe to be around and we are using OSHA as a standard for that. And it must deliver 40 PSI to main water line. And the last one, the system must cost no more than 10,000 to cook. And there are also two standards to take into account. The main more national building code and the US national electrical code. So for our design alternatives, we have three designs. The first one is gravity distribution with water tower. And the second one is ground mounted water <coughs> distribution. And the last one is direct source to main distribution. So we chose to go with the second one, the ground mounted pressurized distribution. So here's a picture of our design. And it actually contains three subsystems source, storage, and distribution. So for the block diagram, the first subsystem, the source, contains the weld, well pump filter and the second subsystem the storage which includes the storage tank and the pump I mean the water sensor and the last one the pump foundation and the last subsystem the distribution contains pump and accumulator and the main line so the water will go from the well to the pump filter tank and then to the main line so for the source we are pulling water from the existing well in Mainmar, so we don't have to build a new one and waste money. We just need to cover this one and we be good to go. And we're also using three stage filtration system with the UV with capacity of 12 gallons per minute. So we need a pump that can pump water 12 gallon at most. And also we're using the water height sensor controller that can turn on the pump when the water level is low turn off the water, the pump when the water level is high. For our next subsystem, um, storage, we have a modular cube storage tank, which will be about 12,000 liters or 3,200 gallons. Uh, with this capacity, we're able to provide 10 gallons per person per day for uh, over 300 people, and that's about uh, what we designed for capacity-wise. And then with our 12 gallons per minute um, that our filter can handle, we can fill the tank from empty to full in about four and a half hours. So that is a quick overnight process. We can make sure we can keep up with our demand. And then we're also using an elevated 
Automated Trust Foundation. Um, we're doing this to keep the, lot, the uh, system up off of the ground during rainy seasons. It can flood, and uh, we don't want any of that water getting into our electronics or anything like that. So we're elevating it, and then um, this also allows for us to pop a valve underneath the tank if we need to quickly um, drain everything out of the system. Next we have our distribution. So coming straight out of the tank, we have a distribution pump, and then right after that, an accumulator. Our accumulator is just there to uh, provide a little bit of cushion in the system, make sure we don't have, get any hard water hammers or sudden pressure spikes, keep us nice and safe. Uh, after that, a pressure sensor and controller will just uh, control when a valve is open or a faucet is turned on, our pressure drives and it kicks our pump on. We keep everything nice and pressurized. And this is just a little uh, map of where we have our water lines uh, laid. And these are the three buildings we are supplying water to, so just a couple of restrooms and a kitchen. So um, our main concern with this system was predicting the response of the system after um, things are changed, valves are open, that type of thing, as well as the safety of our system, because it's very important as engineers to keep everyone safe, as we know. So, um, Going into the modeling process, we made three really big assumptions that are important to note. The first one, we assume that all of the compliance within the system is within the accumulator, um, nothing within the pipes or anything. The second um, assumption we made was that our system is a flat, straight pipe, as uh, we did in our schematic right up here. Um, so we are manually accounting for any head loss in the system. And then um, our third one was just the minor losses in the System are only due to bends and curves in the pipe rather than um, any like through the filter or the controller. So those are three assumptions. From there we were able to take the transform of the differential to find our natural frequency and damping ratio and those two things uh, really drive what the system response looks like. So um, here are all of our equations for those. So pulling from that, we were able to design a prototype uh, model, and this is the response that we got with our values over here that we designed for. Um, as you can see, the response is a little bit under damped, uh, but the overshoot is only about 2.4%. So that is close enough to critically, a critically damped system that we determined that our system is safe enough, and we decided to go ahead and build. So the prototype design is not really different than the main mark design. We have a tank on the left side, and we're only using one pump to do the work of two. And we place our filtration system right before the input of the pump to make sure all the water going through the pump is being uh, filtered and cleared. So if we want to fill up the tank, we have to close the, this valve and that one. So the water will go from the source to the filter, and then from the pump, and then it will go back to the tank. Or if we want to use the water in the tank, we can close this valve and that one. So the water will go from the tank and filter, and from the pump to the distribution zone. So now I have a video to show you all the
uh, to test our model against our actual prototype, basically we needed to be able to verify the pressure flow rate or, or the forces within. Uh, for that, we used just a basic Hall effect sensor that we put in line. Uh, from there, we were able to actually pull out uh, square waves from zero to five volts. Uh, at that point, we were able to take the square waves and using a little bit of Excel magic, take those uh, frequencies of the voltage and convert it into uh, frequencies of flow rate. Uh, at that point, you can see this is our actual model here. And uh, aside from this, this is considered uh, what's called DC noise, or just any DC sensor kind of turning up the operation. The part we want to focus on here actually starts right here, and as you can see the decay, even though I wasn't able to actually plot a line, it is very similar to the decay here. So once we actually got that flow rate, we compared it next to our model, we were actually very, very stoked to see something of that nature. Uh, taking the Fourier transform of those uh, flow rate uh, frequencies, we're actually able to determine what the most predominant frequency within our system would be, and that would be our natural frequency. Here you can see uh, we land right here at one hertz. Again, forget this. This is just the DC noise section. So uh, as you can see, and based on our natural uh, frequency of six radians per second, that equates to about nine, uh, 0.95 hertz. Uh, so once again, you can see we're, we're, we're landing pretty much spot on the head, which is pretty ideal. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's about it. So as far as the, uh, the testing for the water cleanliness, right, kind of very, very important. Um, we had uh, analytical labs down in Boise do it for us. They're pretty awesome sponsors for that type of uh, testing. So here you can see a pre-filter and post-filter, um, you know, testing up here. This is a total coliform or, you know, a fecal coliform test. And I'm sure from the actual name of that test, you can probably assume what it's testing for. Um, you know, at that point, this is the pre-filter analysis. Uh, as far as colonies, we had upwards of 2,400 colonies per uh, per 100 milliliters, which is pretty disgusting. So uh, after that, though, uh, they don't really give us a numerical value. It's basically uh, if there is nothing in there, you're, you're, you're good. If there's anything in there, don't drink it. Um, so this is our test passing through the UV. It was able to kill all that disgusting bacteria. Um, when it comes to the arsenic and the nitrate tests, uh, here we have a, uh, an analysis result. This is actually our maximum that we're allowed to have within, you know, U.S. standards as far as what can be drinkable. Um, and, and, and here, this is actually the minimum value that they can detect. So we fell right between in there, and, and as you can see, we're we're nowhere near any kind of a, a dangerous level. And if you take note to the pre uh, to the pre-filter, you can. Oh, I'm sorry. This is pre-filter, so this is post-filter. But uh, the pre-filter here, you can you can see. I mean. Aside from those selfish animals using the, you know, the drain as like a restroom, this is all actually pretty drinkable stuff, you know? So if we can just kind of get them away from that, anyone has a storm drain. Um, having that said, our, our filter definitely was pretty awesome. Even those guys were, you know, really, really stoked to see um, the, the type of clearing out that, that that filter was able to do, especially with like UV light. Um, so yeah, as far as water, totally bottled. Right under that, and here's just a cost breakdown of that. So that was successful, and um, 
based off of that, we're, we're confident we can keep it under $10,000, definitely, in the part. So just a couple really uh, special thank you to uh, David Badger. He is a PE over uh, for the city of Nampa, and he helped us tremendously with our modeling. So we just want to give a shout out to him. And then as well as Analytical Labs in Boise, they actually donated a $500 water test, which Mike um, explained earlier, that's a $500 test, and they completely donated that to us for free, so a huge shout out to them. And then as well as our professors um, for all of their Are there any questions? Come on, there we go. You used in your prototype ditch water to start with? Drain water, storm water. From Elijah Drain, yeah. Oh, yeah, Elijah right Drain water. water's there. <laughs> Ditch on campus. Okay, and uh, duck water. It got clean afterward. Did you have nerve enough to drink it? You did? No, I haven't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just designed it. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to slip the doctor's stunts, but it didn't work. <laughs> and one more question. Um, when you turn this thing on, yeah, you can have an off, you can have water pumps, but you, you're going to run that pump, which is the biggest expense you've got up there, all the time whenever you turn it on, the pressure's going to drop immediately. Uh, as long as, sorry, go ahead. You put a great big tank in there, a pressure, a bladder type pressure tank, it can only, it will only turn on when, we'll say, 100 gallons have gone through. That might be a worthwhile addition. It'll also stop the bumping. Yeah, so that's our accumulator. Not, not a little one, a big one. Yeah. So in regards to that, uh, solid idea. I, I like it a lot. There's an issue with that. Um, so with water systems, right, I mean, at, at the very beginning of our semester, you know, Dr. Stutz was over here saying, dangerous system. Don't and of course, your yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, so, you know, Dr. Stutz was mentioning how dangerous these systems are, right? And, and the, the most important thing to understand, thank you, is that these natural frequencies and these damping ratios are, are kind of a very, very nice balance between each other. Um, you can't gain one without sacrificing the other. So yes, while that would add a whole bunch of potential energy to our system, it would actually lower our natural frequency down to the point that might be misconstrued as something we don't even want to be near, right? I mean, granted, even a half a turn, a second, very, very difficult to achieve, but our whole process behind this is obviously keeping the natural frequency above one. Uh, that's kind of a, a, a large criteria, even for underdamped. Um, you know, if you end up getting the dip, you know the damping ratio and the natural frequency down below a certain section, it's just not damped at all. Um, so in regards to that, yeah, I understand that throwing that on would be adding a whole bunch more potential. But as far as the overall natural frequency of the system, we really try to do our best to keep that above one, um, so we can consider it critically uh, damped or once again over damped if, if we get to that size. But to answer your other question, um, aside from cost, right? So. Adding a little bit more of a size, uh, after we modeled that, we were actually able to get it to critically damped, right? But in order to do that, the next step up uh, from our accumulator size would be a 4.5 gallon tank, and that would actually work for a critically damped. But when we talk about like monetary issues, which definitely when it comes to engineers, we have to consider that. Um, we were not okay with just arbitrarily spending an extra $40 on a, on a, on a larger size accumulator when our current projection showed a safe system, if that makes sense. Well, I don't quite understand why an accumulator, a typical one in a water system, is nothing but a pressure maintainer while you turn the water on and right. it, it bleeds out, we'll say 50 or 100 gallons or something like that, and then the pump comes on. Sure. If your pump is 2,600 bucks and you wear it out by turning it on and off every time somebody runs a faucet, Right, right. But I don't think the safety is a problem. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't think it would do anything to your safety. Um, as far as safety, no. But once again, uh, those natural frequencies and stuff like that, they, they, they work kind of inversely proportionate to each other. Um, so in order to keep our system to what is considered a critically damped or a close to critically damped section, that's basically what we had to do. Now, our overshoots, you know, if we ended up let's say throwing up the dampening in our natural frequency, yeah, it would probably work, but once again, for cost effectiveness, um, and, and I get what you're saying, right, because the overall would save the life of the pump, uh, but in this type of scenario, I, I mean, we can work and fiddle with that, but once again, we really wanted to kind of keep our system within a certain level as far as, first and foremost, cost, 
um, especially with our prototype. Now, moving forward, um, if for some reason our budget was able to get extended, we just don't want to end up spending too much money on one thing. So as far as the serviceability of the pump, the pump that we chose uh, is, is considered an all-time running pump. I mean, that, that thing is supposed to just you know be a constant demand for 10 years, no problem, service warranty. So we didn't want to take things like that into factor, like as far as, yes, we could balance this out, we could save a little bit of the life, but since she's under a 10-year warranty, um, you know, uh, at that point, we were just kind of okay with what we were sitting at, if that answers your question well enough. Yeah, I have a system that has a tank like that, and the pump does not turn on until you run quite a bit of water. Yeah. Is that your well pump? Yeah. Yeah. And it saves its life. Uh, you know, a three thousand, four thousand dollar pump too. And they wouldn't have done that unless they thought it was a good idea. So I'm just thinking, I don't know. It's certainly not a problem as far as maintenance. And maybe it wouldn't be if every time you turned the faucet on, it had to come on too. But they thought it was. Right, it's right. And take for everything, you know. So we just kind of chose a sweet spot as far as our um, with our model. Um, we are able to. I kind of created an Excel spreadsheet where we are able to kind of tamper with um, all of our values and then see what the response is. And um, with playing with that, um, as far as our design goes, we you know play with this, change this a little bit, change the size of our accumulator tank, um, and there's give and take with everything. So that's just the sweet spot that we were at. Done. So I guess I'd have to ask why the one hertz critically damped requirement. Because I haven't heard you explain why that exists. Sorry, who are you asking? I'm asking you. Oh. I'm watching him. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Oh. Um, so basically, there's a criteria, right? I mean, if you're looking at system responses, um, and you know you want to look at like an underdamp system, right? So that would uh, that would have the damping ratio less than one and the natural frequency at one or below one, or that'd be completely over there. But anyway, so there's certain criteria with vibrations, right? So for an overdamp system, natural frequency greater than one, damping ratio much greater than one. Um, uh, natural frequency greater than one and damping ratio equal to one would be critically damped. So these numbers, once again, you know, as far as what we've been taught at our level <laughs> of undergrad, uh, generally these, these numbers walk very close hand in hand as far as the response to your system. So as I was mentioning before, the balance between the two will determine your overall response. And while, uh, yes, adding more compliance to the system would increase your damping and definitely draw that out, uh, you still, once again, have just a different type of oscillation within it. And we didn't want to get any kind of like an undershoot, overshoot to where we may see some sort of a frequency before it actually damps out. With this one, we saw just a basic initial spike, once again, no more than an order of 2%, you know, over uh, the function. So once again, as far as our design, everything seemed to end out really, really well as far as that whole section. Does, does that answer your question? Finally. Finally. Uh, you said that it only added $40 and you're $2,000 under budget, and it actually put you at a point that you're good with or concerned about. Sorry about that. That was specifically for our prototype, not for our Myanmar system. That, that has a different budget altogether. We literally, by the time we were done buying pumps, pipes, filters, everything, we are getting down to the nitty gritty as far as our you know controllers and stuff like that, and we had to account for everything. So every place that we could cut costs for our prototype, I mean, every place to shave points, that's basically how we ended up having to engage, because it's not just a happy balance of cost or potential energy or natural frequency or flow rates. I mean, they all have to very much mesh together, as I'm sure you know, any engineer can, can attest to. I mean, it's not one thing or the other. It has to be kind of a, a full spectrum of understanding. What yes. size accumulator were you looking at using for the Myanmar system? For Myanmar, we got everything this section. Oh, sorry, go ahead. At the very last slide, uh, we were able to use an eight gallon one to get this type of response. Um, if we increased it, once again, the damping ratio went just below one, or the natural frequency went just below one. That's probably gonna be a big difference, like with your, for your house system. The prototype has such a short run that the resistance is so low that you have to have a small accumulator to keep it from going. Basically, pressure spikes in the system. If your piping has, I think, how, how much piping are y'all using? So we're using 140 feet no, no, uh, for not, Myanmar? Not Myanmar, your prototype. Literally five. Yeah, five feet, <laughs> so five feet of plastic piping, small accumulator. You probably have, what, a couple hundred feet piping, bigger accumulator. 
So we have the big VMR system here. Yeah. So for this one, we have 100, uh, 140 feet. So we're going to build it bigger. You do? Okay. Can you flip to your slide <coughs> with your cost estimate? Uh, on the VMR actual installation, um, can you walk through that list? Um, except for the labor, which is a big question mark to me, but we'll get that for a moment. Um, well, have to the actual equipment. Um, people in VMR um, yeah. workers usually make, if they're really skilled, $2 a day. <laughs> so, the North. The get in use zone pastors are sending a work and witness, this is news to you guys too, a work and witness team to Myanmar in January. And some of the pastors may be belabored. So preachers work really cheap. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we are not asking so, them. <laughs> all right. Anyway, forget the labor for a uh, Storage, pumps, filter, piping, foundation. Which of those parts? Are, are at some risk of not being readily available in that location. You know, the same issue we asked about Liberia, what what technology there is is at risk of not being available in that? You know, this is something that we Wait. honestly had a really hard time with, was really finding out much of anything about Myanmar. It was a huge constraint for our project um, because there's very there was very limited communication with the campus. And as far as you know, Google searches, there's not a whole lot in English about what is readily available or the costs for them there. So this budget is based off of um, cost here in the US, and we, uh, we made it pretty generous um, for each category. Uh, we overshot what we actually um, intend to spend. And then we, that is why we tacked on this miscellaneous cost of $1,000, because if we need to ship something or there's you know, some kind of taxes that we don't know about. Um, you know. So that was a huge constraint for our project is that we don't actually know and couldn't figure out with all the research we did exactly what that looks like there. But I would like to make a comment on that. I want everyone to remember that Myanmar is literally right by China. Go check your products at home. Most of that stuff is from there. So we're assuming, you know, as far as electronics, uh, pumps, uh, the Alibaba website that we actually got the tank from, the quotes and stuff from, are actually right out of China. So um, everything that we found here in America, <laughs> we definitely were able to double up with, not in Myanmar, but very close, either Europe, Asia, somewhere right by there can, can get them what they need if they don't have it readily available. And while we do understand that Myanmar is a third world, that doesn't mean that they're not completely without anything. They have hardware stores, uh, you know, power drills, electricity, all that good stuff. I mean, it might not be all this, but still, uh, it's definitely, you know, what they can work with. So, um, are you going to, I mean, I assume once this is built, somebody is going to have to test the, the water, and there might need to be ongoing testing of the water, and have you thought about how to do that? Our part of the design, and we're we're really just going to hand it off. We had um, we've had so much limited communication with even the people on campus that we, you know, we kind of discounted um, being able to talk to them at all. So we're just kind of going to do this. We're going to hand it off. We're going to, you know, we have some um, some specs on, you know, when the the system needs to be blown out. And I didn't mention this, but we do have a blowout um, stub so that the system can be cleaned. And we have, you know, we've thought about the maintenance of the system. Okay. Um, but as far as testing that goes, we, we don't have anything for that. Um, on that though, specifically to our storm drain, uh, right, aside from arsenic and nitrate, uh, the scientists were more than happy to tell me that that was probably some of the dirtiest water they've ever seen. Uh, so, you know, under that assumption, the fact that it was able to extract all that disgustingness, um, I, I think it might be a safe bet to assume uh, while their water quality will be different, um, it, it could almost be probably assumed that it'll be very similar to the disgustingness of ours. I really doubt that, you know, I mean, it's groundwater, you know, so there's going to be, you know, animals 
stuff in there and all sorts of other loveliness. But and we have decided to use the exact same um, filter that we use for our prototype because um, it works really well, as we can see, and it's a lot cheaper than a lot of the alternatives that we consider that work just as well. Um, so, so we're pretty confident that the water coming out of that well, unless there's something dead in it, you know, which is a possibility, but um, that it's probably not going to be as dirty as the water that we tested here. Yeah. It looks to me like with your single pump solution, you're going through the filter twice, is that right? Correct. Yeah, and that was just for um, simplicity's sake for us testing it. Um, you know, instead of having to run the water through the tank, we could just pull right, just, you know, so we can speed up our testing because we were, we had time constraints. So this way we can either fill the tank up and then run it, or we can pull from our source and run it, and it'll go through the filter either way. Manual operation as well. On a note, uh, on a note yeah. to that as well, uh, while we were kind of speculating about the condition of the system, uh, obviously we were worried about algae growth in the tank. Uh, right, so by double filtering it, whether it's coming from the well or from the tank itself, we can kind of just knock that out as far as a concern. Yes, can you give us a slide about your water count? Yeah. Our, our what? Your water storage. Oh, water storage. Safe, 
seemed redundant. Yeah. So what's the lifespan of this system? The, um, the filter has a 10-year life on it. The pump. The pump itself, uh, our distribution pump is a 10-year warranty, manufacturing warranty on it, uh, since it is a constant life. It's supposed to be a real heavy duty, you know, expected to flow all the time type of situation. You know, with the foundations, anyone with any experience with pressure treated knows that, you know, depending on how saturated the area is, right, that could be about a 10 to 20 year type of scenario. So, we're, I mean, overall, we're averaging, aside from things like light bulb change and maybe filter changes, 10 years is about the solid size for this system without any kind of real issues happening. Before we say thanks to this group, uh, if you are interested in it's too late to travel with Dr. Stutz. You would have had to have your ticket bought already. You're going with Beta Tim to Liberia. But this team's project is going to be kicked off in implementation in January, right after New Year's 2018. There's still time for you to actually go to Myanmar. You guys are going to be graduated, but if you're interested in that, please come and talk to me sometime about going to Myanmar with the Northwest Nazarene group next year. It's actually not just from the university, it's from the whole, the whole uh, zone. And with that, let's say thank you to this team.